Welcome everyone, this is Denny and Carl with Get Wisdom and today we're going to, going to continue with this channeling series and we're going into a new uh, territory uh, with, this, with this channeling and Carl's going to channel Qian Xiao Shu, which is a very famous film and television actress from mainland China and uh, she started on TV and came to fame in a, uh, a TV series that was called uh, Dreams of Red Mansions. And then she got out of acting and she became a um, an advertising mogul in mainland China and became a billionaire. And uh, just a, a kind of an amazing person and I, I kind of I feel f- fortunate that we that we found her as our first, you know, real, you know, Chinese uh, channeling subject. Uh, for the series, just because it touches on so many things that's important to get wisdom right now, because we're trying to uh, trying to make some inroads into uh, that country to introduce get wisdom over there. So um, anyway, that's our challenge subject for today. And Carl and I were discussing about some of the difficulties with uh, doing a subject like this. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get started. So thanks everybody for joining us, and thank you Carl for doing this with us, and. Um, I'll let you uh, hold forth on, w- on what this might portend for us <laughs> in this new new area. Yes, well, welcome everyone, and I'm glad you're all here. Uh, we've been looking forward to this, Denny and I, for a while, because we want to reach out to our human family members in a wider area of the globe to touch base and share what we know with you. That's really the impetus for this and and to inform ourselves and learn and grow as we're going to need to in seeing the widest possible landscape in what's come before and what people are going through and what they've gone through in the past as a part of this human drama and We're, of course, concerned with the human dilemma, what might be less than perfect, what needs fine-tuning, what needs drastic help, perhaps. And so that's always kind of uppermost in our minds. But we can learn from one another. And so we're open to that, and we're eager to get perspectives from as wide an array of people as we can. And no two humans are alike, but we all know that culturally <clears throat> we're shaped by our environment and who we hang around with and and the lore of our region and our geographic uh, entity we reside within, a nation state typically. And that's inevitable. It's just like home and who you're with determines a lot about who you are. So, so we have room to grow and we're, we're open to that by the same token. I want to caution you that as a channeler, I'm the man in the middle. So I can only speak the way I speak, talk the way I talk and use words I know and understand so I can't channel someone in a foreign language and have it come through in their language and mimic that or pass that on to you with the correct pronunciations and so on. So if I mispronounce things or even fail to grasp the meaning of what I'm saying and parts of this get distorted in some way it's because it's going through levels of translation to get here right and i'm the rate limiting i'm one of the rate limiting steps i can only tell you what i can understand within my mind so it's sort of like i'm listening to a translator speaking to the subject that's really how this works yeah it's done through creator of all that is but i'm only human so <laughs> Yeah. So I'm just warning you in advance. I'm not going to talk like the person. I'm not going to sound like them. Yeah, and I, I think the same thing holds true f- for my role in this too, is in terms of 
investigate, you know, selecting the top, selecting the channeling subjects, selecting the questions, you know, researching the, the topics. Carl and I were talking about, you know, there, there's a lot of famous Chinese people that you can learn about in the English language, but a lot of the accounts of these people are very dry and kind of clinical. There's no, there's no like meat to the story. It's kind of difficult to find out like, well, who is, who was this person? So um, fortunately I'm getting help and I'm getting um, Chinese um, accounts of these people, and, but then it needs to be translated. So I'm using the translation tools on the internet and stuff. And Carl, one of the things that Carl and I discovered is that the, the pronouns, so the description translated by Qin Chao Shu is all, it's all treating the, the topic as if she was a, a he. And uh, so it's a little disconcerting, discombobulating. And of course, that brings up other, other issues like, well, is this really translated correct, correctly? Am I reading you know, what they're saying about this person with this translation into English? Is this, is this even accurate? You know, are we using the right words here? So that was, that was a, that's a hurdle that's not going to go away, I don't think. I mean, we might get better with time as we learn more about Chinese culture, the language, and whatnot. But we have, you know, Get Wisdom has started an outreach to China through one of their big social media platforms. And we've hired a, um, a company to help us um, make some advertising and promotional inroads there because we do have a, a small Chinese website, getwisdom.cn. So um, this is very small, fledgling kind of attempt, but we have to start somewhere. Um, so th- this will be interesting. She, she had quite an interesting life. She actually... Uh, got out of the advertising business um, and um, she got breast cancer and I'm not sure whether she got the breast cancer before or after but then she became a Buddhist nun and went to a temple and refused allopathic medical care and died from breast cancer in I think it, as a as a Buddhist nun so she went through um, you know most most famous people they kind of stay in their field, you know, they're an actress or they're a business mogul or they're, you know, they're a religious person. You know, she was, she actually had three lives in one. You could say that. Mm. And then didn't live very long. I think she died in her forties. Let's see. She was born in 65 and died in 2007. She wasn't very old. Um, Yeah. So quite a life though. Yeah. Very extraordinary life. I would say. And, you know, it, rising to a position of prominence and recognition in a cultural setting that is vast in its set of components, one wonders how anyone can compete and get to the top in, in that kind of an environment. It just adds more uh, credit, I think, to that person. Yeah. that they've been able to achieve a level of recognition by their peers for excellence and accomplishment. So anyone, I think, automatically is rather extraordinary to be one of the ones who kind of rises to the top and, and makes an impression and leaves a mark on the culture in whatever capacity that might be. Mm-hmm. Most of us are non-entities, you know, we're just You're passing numbers. through. Yeah. yeah, we're just passing through. Yeah. We know a small group of people, and when we're gone, you know, no one will eventually remember that we came this way, and it's just part of being human. So I think the people who contribute to the culture are doing important work, or at least they're trying. Mm -hmm. Because we look to that for understanding. It kind of gives us a sort of grounding, um, a foundation. It might only be a myth. It might just be beliefs and maybe not quite reality. But it gives us something to to grow on and, and build on just as a a role model or a a way of thinking of our lives in comparison and contrast with what's playing out in the culture. And those things are useful. You know, they can be a wonderful force for good. 
they they may have their problems too, especially if there's distortion and uh, corruption of some kind. And we, we know a lot about those possibilities. But most human beings, we believe, are divine extensions. We're more than we think we are. And so there's a a, a, a kind of seed of greatness in each one of us. And I think that's what's being displayed on both sides. The people who've got talent, who sort of end up on display as leaders and spokespersons and iconic figures in the culture are letting their greatness blossom for all to see. But the people who watch them and are moved by them and are raised up by them, it happens because they have a seed of greatness within themselves. Mm-hmm. And they're kind of resonating. They're in, they're in tune with that person and what they're about and what they're trying to show you. And so the two are not so different. You know, one's on the platform, one's down below in the audience. But there's a a harmony that's taking place there, a unity, if only for a while. So, you know, we're all important. We're all significant. You know how uh, some actors... um they they have a like a, a signature role and they um their whole acting career they can never really shake off that one role that they did like spock you know doc mr spock is a great example um you know uh little joe cartwright you know they, there's literally this thematic in these uh roles that get played by certain actors and it just that just sticks with them the whole time that's what they say about this woman because she played the uh, the leading role, uh, Lin Jiayu, in this drama, uh, Dream of Red Mansions, which uh, supposedly was written in 1791. And so they say in China, when any- anybody thinks about this character, Lin Jiayu, they think about the actress, Qian Xiaoshu, and then she, and it just sticks. You know, she's she. They are almost like one in the same person. That's the way people think about her, and. Uh, and I think they've done some more modern uh, versions of that story, but still, you know, she set the the bar for mm-hmm. who that person was, how people see her, how the character was interpreted from the original work. And uh, I have a I have a question about that in here, um, because sometimes I think you know um, that's part of the divine realm is to bring something to life that was you know maybe just in in the written form from literature or something like that. And then bring that to the screen, and it it gets embodied into a wider circle of people, you know, um, like like a theme, like a um, an archetype, if you will. Um, that was the feeling I got when I when I studied her, you know. And then she she used that as a launch as a launching pad for what she did in her life. And she also did something that, that I'm going to ask a question about that seemed very strange. Is after that immense amount of popular popularity that was generated in the mid '80s. She went and joined the army and became like a troop actor for the army and did nothing else. She was beholden to the army as an actor, actress, um, which was kind of like a reverse career move from our perspective. And then after the arm, the stint in the army, then she went into the advertising business and, uh, and just took, took that by storm. Um, I think in 19, uh, 2004, she was uh, named... China's 30 outstanding female advisors, ad- advertisers, and she's Woman of the Year in China, China's Economy by World Managers Weekly. And um, she was, you know, at the top of her game um, by the early 2000s in advertising and became a billionaire. No small achievement. No, especially <laughs> in, a, in a country where at least we're, we're taught to believe that something like that is virtually impossible. You know, if you come from humble beginnings in a in a in a closed society, and um, uh, you know what we're we're led to believe it's an anti-capitalist type, you know, communist type uh, economy and gov- you know government, that you know those kinds of things don't happen to people, but they do. Well, that's 
interesting in and of itself. Yeah, for sure. yeah. I wasn't sure how many questions we should ask about that aspect. We have to be careful here because it's different. You know, well, and, and you know, and let me just say that we have a basic respect for others and their ways of life and cultures. We have our own ideas and our own preferences, and that's that's governed, of course, by our own bias and what we're used to. But it, it's really not about superiority. It's about happiness and and the possibilities that exist. What we hear from our higher sources from Creator is that really nothing humans do is all that wonderful because we're we're so limited in so many ways, and we're just trying to figure things out still. Yeah. So we're trying them out, we're trying them on, and and testing them to see will they work. Yeah. And so this is a process, and we're all somewhere along this path and doing what we can do. And none of us are doing it all that well, I don't think. So uh, we're not in a position to to point fingers arbitrarily at what others are about because we're not living in their shoes and that's very presumptuous. So, uh, you know, we, I try to hold those things in check and in terms of our conversations with the light beings, they come through with their perspective. So as a channeler, I'm kind of, Again, the man in the middle, and I'm forced to say the words that come to me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not always totally happy doing it. If it's something that's dark, it's something that is, in some ways, an exposure of something or critical of something, I might squirm a bit, but I try to do my duty because that's why I'm here. I'm here to be an honest broker, at, you know, to try to convey a message, whatever it might be. Right. So again, it's it's the beings in the light who have the responsibility to be uh, respectful and to not push the boundaries too strongly, too soon, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I and I they, they do appreciate that. Yeah, and, they, and actually, you know, they do a better job in terms of preserving, um, you know, uh, preserving the respect for free will and. Um, being considerate of safety issues than humans ever will. Yeah. And and that's a big part of what's what's going on here because we are kind of digging around trying to peek under the rug and uh if we just had a free hand in that I I think we would probably you know potentially could make some pretty serious mistakes. Well, we we do our best to try to avoid that. But, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and truth is in the eye of the beholder also. Yeah. There's no official universally accepted body of truth, if you hadn't noticed. Right. Everyone and- has their own set of operating principles and cultural beliefs. Right. And the divine realm and creator is not in the business of changing minds. Well, and that's true. They're respectful of our freedom to be and think how we wish and how we choose. Even if we're not in divine alignment from their perspective, they won't come in and give us a lecture and tell us not to do something. They have to let us have free reign. We specifically go to them with questions about how are we doing and are we doing it well? Are we making mistakes, can we do something better, then they're allowed to tell us. So that's always a component of the intention in our channeling work. So we're we're not shy about doing that. We do want to be respectful of our audience and their preconceived ideas. But we have a lot at stake, we feel, in finding truth and, and... shedding light on things and getting informed to do it better and in ways that can help. So that's what we're after here. And if it steps on people's toes, it's unfortunate. Yeah. But sometimes it can't be helped because 
we're all in a different place. You know, it's like the, 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 the issue of life that what hurts one may help another. You know, if you're in the business of being a, an undertaker, a funeral director, someone dying in your neighborhood is a good thing. You know, I mean, it just is. Yeah. So it, 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 the world is filled with many complexities. Yeah. And many conflicting beliefs and attitudes and, and circumstances. So we need to find better ways to make things work for the world as a whole and that's ultimately what we want to help with okay all right so we have seven questions for her and um and we and we do have some more china, uh, famous chinese people in the in the lineup that we're going to uh, pepper into the series as we go uh for the same reasons that we're doing this one just because we're trying to um build a bigger tent invite more people in you know russia china india uh the spanish-speaking nations uh you know, Brazil, the Portuguese speaking nations, and elsewhere eventually if we can. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, I will do my thing to get in the state of consciousness that I need. <clears throat> and I will reach out to creator of all that is to connect me to our subject for today in the light. Chen Xiao Shu, so she can speak through me with safety and with some protection to prevent any kind of interference. And that's quite important to go about channeling in that way. And I always make a mention of this. If you're interested in channelers and what they do, be mindful of the fact that more than 90% are really being fooled. They're not channeling who they think they are. They've reached an imposter. There's many out there. And channelers are just nice people thinking that if they can reach into a lofty realm, a lofty figure will answer. And they're not doing it with rigor and with safeguards and getting divine help to safeguard the process. And then they end up talking to an imposter who will lead them along, give them encouragement and some, usually something of a positive nature. We call it sweetness and light kinds of conversations. And it's very palatable and it can be uplifting and satisfying. But if you want to work on problems, they have no answers and they won't be given answers that work. They'll be given platitudes and sort of uh, spiritual exercises that really are pretty hollow unless you're working actually with the Almighty in some capacity. So that's just my uh, disclaimer here and why. I endeavor to be scrupulous with this. I do the best I can. I can never guarantee anything. And this is one of the characteristics of the light as well. That because you're free to disbelieve, they will not prove themselves to you. Because most people have some doubt. They harbor some doubt. So that means they can't demonstrate conclusively for anyone, any skeptic, that they're real, that this is true and accurate and valid, what we're doing here. So it's kind of a handicap that we have to live with. But I, I will do the, the best I can, and hopefully we'll have a, a good session that's of help. Okay. This is Chen Xiaoqiu speaking. Thank you for joining us. Were you able to transition successfully? Did becoming a Buddhist nun in the temple at Chen Chun help or hinder your transition? I had trouble transitioning. And the reason was 
complex, more a sum total of my prior experience in life. Not only the current life as I left it, but many other lifetimes as well that colored my existence during the current chapter. The Buddhist practice as proffered in today's world is a diminution of spiritual realities and spiritual practice and in some ways a distortion of the beliefs of the Buddha and more a reflection of his followers and students who shaped and altered things subsequent to his passing. It is not a direct involvement with the creator of all that is, and as such is not a shield or a source of strength that will guarantee a partnership with the divine. It is a way of thinking and feeling and being that has many helpful aspects for grounding and centering and achieving an inner tranquility that has great benefit when people are otherwise adrift without an anchor. You need some place to be, a place to deposit yourself, to connect to, as a starting point and a reference point as well. A home to come back to when you're out and about in the world. That is what Buddhism offers its followers a kind of safe space to be where there is order, where there are principles, where there is an importance of the self and a yearning for a kind of purity to let drop away the cares of the day, the distortions of the outer world and the pressures and manipulations of others that can be corrupting. But that is still short of reaching to the divine and asking the divine to be a partner in life alongside you. That is something that can change your life for the better for all of time. It is the true heritage you come from. And that is what people yearn for. And why anything short of that will not be fully satisfying. And what is left in the vacuum is the rise of inner discord and darker impulses to look for security in the material and potentially to take advantage of others. This is not a divine substitute. It is a lessening, a cheapening of the being. So Buddhism safeguards against the negative impulse but also isolates you from the true divine outreach that would be a completion of who you are as a physical being. In essence, you are taking a distant journey from the divine when you come into life. And you choose to do this to help your brothers and sisters in the physical 
to learn from the experience and to grow in wisdom and project a greater future for humanity to bring it into existence through this preparation to earn your place, to earn your wings, and earn your energies on the part of the divine, enabling you to have a much larger place, a much larger role in things. So when I passed, I still did not connect it. It was an inner yearning that led me to Buddhism. And that was all well and good. And I greatly treasure all that I learn. And my loving companions in that journey who shared it with me and became my friends. I have the utmost respect for all I knew, regardless of station, regardless of background and affiliation. I see now from the light, all are doing their best and all are working under difficult circumstances because all are under attack by the darkness and that colors everything. So after my demise, functionally in the physical, my mind continued its journey, entering into the spirit realm. And I was accosted by dark beings, many of them. They preyed on me to take my energy for themselves and tormented and tortured me to get more of it. This is done out of desperation, but it is desperation born of necessity because they turned away from the divine themselves and have been cut off after attempts to rescue them of many, many millions of years. This is the patience of the Creator to allow forgiveness of even the most grievous errors if one chooses to reconnect at long last with the divine. They will not do so, these dark ones. They are beyond the pale and are lost. They need healing. And thanks to my rescue to bring healing and raise me up, those very dark beings who tormented me have been rescued as well. And they are still being attended to in a kind of rehabilitation program for the depraved who have turned to evil as a way of existence. This is a great achievement and a kind of miracle and is something that deserves to be honored and revered and taken as an important object lesson for living. If you live to live on, you will be preparing yourself for your eventual passing from life as you now experience it. 
And if you are envisioning a return to a loving creator and many friends who predeceased you, who have returned to the light and are waiting to greet you, you will be in much better shape than I and need not experience that difficulty in making your transition. Okay, thank you. You had an extraordinary life in terms of your success in acting and also in the advertising business, perhaps surpassing all women and many men who had pursued similar careers in recent times in China and in the world. Can you tell us a little bit about your life's mission? Many who have admired me will be surprised. But I know you asking and speaking for me these questions and answers will have assumed this already, that a life such as mine, as likely as not, was planned and supported and encouraged and assisted to be successful, at least in part, through the workings of the divine. I was a light worker. This is true for every human being who comes into existence. It is the only reason to be human. It is why you were created in the first place to heal and help others like yourself. You are rescuers, you are missionaries, you are guides, you are teachers. And you are spiritual physicians, but do not know it. That is the curse of existence, to come in as an infant, helpless and ignorant, and largely cut off from a larger awareness, not only of the workings of the divine, but even your own personal history, where you've come from, and all you have done prior to arriving in your life as a voyager. This is the human dilemma. As the inner kernel, (coughs) you are cast on a sea with little to help you. You are learning everything from this raw beginning, in effect, almost starting over, even though you have been alive for many, many thousands of years and had experiences in many other worlds and many lifetimes on the earth working through its difficulties and grappling with the dilemma of being a human and all that that challenges you as a consequence. My life was given in service to a higher purpose It was to bring more light into the world, to have a life living by example to others, to illustrate many divine principles, the striving for excellence, the striving for knowledge and wisdom, to understand 
the interaction with others and one's obligations, responsibilities, and the workings of the mind in how to communicate and establish relationships and strike a balance wanting to help and serve but also to safeguard and promote the self in order to be successful to have the strength and accomplishments to have something to share with others all of you are spokespersons for the divine each in your own way because you are literally a part of the almighty this is not taught if anything religion would view it as blasphemy to put yourself on the level with god that is not quite what we are saying. We are not saying you are God or God's equal. You are a component, a portion of divine energy. So you are lesser, but at the same time you are lofty. That inner yearning propelled me forward and helped me to be successful in the many twists and turns of my career, moving from one arena to another as I did, and as you will be exploring with me. But the basic drive, the basic purpose, and the reason for my success was in part my physical attributes and talents. But far beyond that, the divinity within me. This is an energy. It is an intention. And it is a kind of power that is deceptive because it comes on the wings of love. And love appears a gentle tool, a refinement, the icing on the cake, but often taken for granted and dismissed as a secondary objective, a kind of entertainment or enjoyment. To be experienced and turned to on occasion when one has time away from greater duties and responsibilities. The whole thrust of my life was finding ways to bring love to bear in every setting, in every environment I inhabited. If the entire world would make that its goal, the world could be transformed simply with that idea embraced as a working principle. This is why I was not promoting a religion or a movement or an ideology. I was promoting the basic currency of every such body of belief in its essence. 
because love is the energy of creator's consciousness and its origin. It is a kind of magic medicine. Wherever it is applied, it can work wonders, if not miracles. Because it is the source and essence of wisdom. It is a kind of universal composite of wisdom that has the capability of righting any wrong, bridging any gap, filling any void, adding greatness to the world and the universe beyond. If you think about every need, every desire, every kind of suffering, In the end, what makes it tolerable or solves the problem is the addition of love in some form. It may be in the form of reason and structure to provide a better framework, a better foundation or platform even in a material sense, through the workings of an architect, an engineer, to solve a practical, physical problem in the environment that might be key to the livelihoods of others and successful and safe living conditions. Such basic things are achieving a balance of good over non-good. Something that excels and appreciates and grows wisdom and happiness in being shared with others is an idea and energy and an outcome that transcends religion and political ideologies. They are trying to do the same thing with words and concepts, but when executed successfully, we defy you to measure that success without seeing love in the equation somewhere. If only simple caring, attending to duty, and making personal contributions and sacrifice for the benefit of others. These are acts of loving kindness. And the test of this is the avoidance and shirking of duty of the sociopath who can only take from others and never give unless there is a con game in motion of some kind. Everything I was doing with my life had a divine purpose. This was not conscious, but it was felt by my inner being. And I was in tune with that enough to want to be where I was and doing what I was all about in the moment because I could feel my life could make a difference. And I found that exciting and deeply satisfying. 
the gaining of adulation and material wealth were enjoyable to me. But they were never the be-all and end-all of my existence as the major goal. There are many who compete and attempt to succeed and do so at the expense of others pushing them out of the way, even undermining or deliberately sabotaging their lives unjustly and unfairly to gain an advantage and advance more rapidly. That is not only a dangerous game to play, It is a kind of evil because it is a stain on your soul. It leaves you unclean and that blemish will have consequences. There is an ultimate reckoning always in play. And you will learn this, each one of you, for yourselves. When you return to be with me one day in the light and have an opportunity to review everything you have done and what you will see is your energy being launched And all that it does as it moves outward from you as its origins. And that energy loops back to you inevitably. And outside of your control, you cannot stop it. And you cannot shield yourself from its consequences because this is part of the fabric of things. It is woven into the texture of the universe that all is interconnected and interdependent. If you bring about harm, that will continue to exist and it will join up with you to taste its consequences. What I was attempting with my life and its course was to be a kind of adventurer, but with an inner purpose and goal that was a soul-based goal. I did not think of it in that way, nor perceive of this grand scheme that was unfolding. I was simply carried along by life, as all are, but always looking, looking over the horizon to think about something new and different. And the reason was not because I was flighty or hard to satisfy. So I would be chronically discontent. It was because I had an inner drive knowing I was there to do things and experience things and reach out and touch the lives of as many different kinds of people as I could. And that brought me to those key turning points 
where I changed direction. But the force behind it was a divine impulse working through me because it was emanating from my soul, which is a living part of each one of you and much larger than you and much wiser than you in your current form. You are experiencing but a small part of yourself in your current life as a physical human being. That is difficult to understand and accept. But it is very much the case. It is, in a sense, being the voice on a telephone. And you believe you are that voice. But the brain, the driving force, is not in that telephone, but somewhere else. And a much grander, varied, and complex integration and body of intelligence and love energy it is a body of consciousness that is immaterial but transcends the material supersedes the material and makes the material happen. It is the formative energy of the universe you consist of and makes you not only a created being, but a creator. That is who you are in your essence. That is what I was trying to express in my life. The creative potential that is a yearning of my soul. Okay, thank you. Why did you refuse surgery for your breast cancer disease and what were your main concerns transitioning from your life as a businesswoman to that of being a Buddhist nun? This is an interesting twist and turn. I was under certain pressures in my life. And this made me distrustful of others. I was seeking solace. And I was seeking simplicity. Because... I had always run into beings who were corrupted and saw corruption on a large scale and rigid thinking and much judgmental thinking. And I had an inner sense that it was wrong but as an individual, little power to change those around me. And I reached a point where I needed a gentler existence, free from being buffeted about by all of those outside pressures. And I still felt the inner yearnings that were truly spiritual in nature but lacked an outlet that seemed satisfying to me because nothing I had been doing as a physical person matched 
the feeling within. It was a feeling of a kind of greatness, a grandness, an all-encompassing tolerance through love. The world seemed woefully unable to understand or bring into existence what value it seemed to me was there in wanting to be a loving person, a fair person, if others were not doing so. It is the same old story that wanting to be good and do things that are positive in today's world will be seen as weak and naive and vulnerable and are often targeted. I did not appreciate there is a large purposeful orchestration of evil seeking to undermine those wanting to improve things. I was seeking an escape from the material existence represented by the world around me. And I was pressured in ways that I withdrew and sought that peace and tranquility in turning to Buddhism and a simpler lifestyle. This was only a coping mechanism, not an answer because I was being ravaged internally by the workings of the world still, because it was registered on my very composition, my makeup energetically. And in the records of all that I have done and experienced through multiple lifetimes, As a reincarnated being, I have lived before and had many adventures and many triumphs that were fleeting and many failures that were devastating. The sum total being more negative than positive And that some total created within me a karmic liability in the sense of a law of cause and effect that what is done will have a consequence and can be revisited because it is linked to you as the originator in their creation of the energy you put forth. So within me, there was a raging storm. I had a life of pushing boundaries and walking a fine line in many settings where there were powerful powerful people and potential dangers for me in being seen as too unconventional and too independent-minded. This was highly stressful even though a strong impulse within 
to be a contributor and to be in my own way a change agent, always an advocate for something more, something better. Many people find that threatening if it is not they bestowing a benefit or creating an opportunity, they feel left out. They feel their authority is being bypassed and will take it personally and then might seek some form of reprisal to contain someone who is outdoing them, at least as perceived. There are many people like this. We all want things to be better and to have more from life. If people created and gave of themselves unreservedly, the world would expand dramatically at a much more rapid pace. This goes on at a much lower level of intensity because people are afraid. They husband their resources. They guard them jealously and will often refuse to share and choose nothing as opposed to sharing partly with someone else that would actually gain something for them in the bargain. I was retreating from that world I had experienced, but the inner torment within me still echoed all of those issues, conflicts, and the past history of many difficulties. The energy of all of that unresolved drama was unleashed within my body. That was the true origin of my illness. It was the karma of past pain and suffering revisiting as energy and taking a toll on my physical makeup. In a sense, I had an inner awareness. There was a relationship between my cancer and my life. In a sense, the rot within me was my failure to change the rot in the outer world. I worked to transform, but felt I made too little a difference. And so I felt as pessimistic about changing my body as I did about changing the outer world and surrendered to the negativity that came over me. I turned to my new beliefs in inner tranquility, believing naively that by isolating that reality from my thoughts, I could uncreate it. And that was not to be. It is a kind of magical thinking. Human consciousness has power. But if used in ignorance, 
will dissipate. It is like launching an arrow while blindfolded. When you are blind to even the nature and location of your target, In my case, the cause of my illness was not in my tissues. It exists in other times and places I have lived when bad things happened. Humans have no arrow for that target. That can only come from the divine when requested by a human wanting divine assistance. So my attempts at self-care fell short. It was more a denial than a healing because I was in ignorance of the true origin and mechanism for this infirmity in my body. This continues to be true of the world to a large extent. The idea of consciousness is under study, even in a medical setting. And there are many who achieve great healing outcomes through the workings of the mind alone. What they do not realize is they are light workers. They are still connected to the divine, even though they may not believe it actively in the way I am describing it to you. This can enable them to enlist divine help because they are in enough alignment to have a partnership and to be joined in their healing efforts. by divine energy, to amplify and help achieve success. The unfortunate reality is such practitioners do not themselves fully understand what they are doing and how it comes about. So it is always a hit and miss proposition and unreliable. It would be much better for the broader world to have a deeper understanding of the realities of existence and the true needs of the body in being an integrated whole with a spiritual component as well as the physical. This is your origin and your birthright, no matter what anyone else might believe or tell you. It has been demonstrated over and again through the ages by those who have done works of greatness and participated in miracles of all kinds that could not happen through the workings of the human level. Something else is involved. They can invoke to give them assistance. I speak these words because I am in the light 
and live this directly with a full awareness on all levels. I am enmeshed in the energies of all that is happening and I can trace it to its origins and see its consequences and see the inner workings of the intentions lost by the sea of humanity and interlopers confusing you and interfering with your existence. It is an ongoing saga and a complex one. I did not know these things while I was alive, struggling to do the best I could. But I learned much along the way. And it gives me the greatest of joy to share this perspective with you today. Because no matter what I lived and suffered, if it moves one person to expand their awareness and look for a better solution for their lives, it will have made what I endured worthwhile. Okay, thank you. In 1987, why was the role of the leading actress, Lin Jiu, in, emotion, in the emotional drama Dream of Red Mansions, written in 1791, so important? And why did it have such an impact and popularity? We would say there was a broad theme here that arose again and again and again. The theme of humanity, the inner yearnings, all share in common no matter their station in life, the material accomplishments, the privileges, the luxuries and accoutrements of success. Nothing has value greater than family and the interpersonal relationships where love and acceptance can be felt and experienced. Again, love is the energy of existence. Everything that makes for greatness or diminishment is involved with the equation of the love force. All human beings are thirsty for love. They yearn for love. They seek love and miss its absence and suffer greatly as a consequence. When people watch a drama of that kind and watch the progress of the characters and identify with them in their quest for meaning and fulfillment, they can learn important lessons that may, in fact, be indirect and subliminal. Those two things are somewhat different. If you search for meaning and purpose, that might not bring you a material gain, but a different kind of satisfaction. That is something enjoyed 
through a more demanding palate, one born of experience and maturity. There are many whose lives are enmeshed in trivialities and really truly characterized by a lack of growth and a lack of depth. This is one of the consequences of poverty. It stunts the growth by cutting off material necessities. and thus presents a severe barrier in the life journey. Once beyond the critical necessities to deal with the fragile nature of the human body, you are left more able to focus on the other aspects, again, of physicality, the biological imperatives of sexual feelings and this mysterious ability to love and to value love in relationships and to seek companionship with others who will accept you and not be critics and compete with you and cause misery. Life is a journey through a forest of friends and foes. People view life often through a selfish lens. To showcase that has value because it puts the spotlight on the imperfections of the world, the people are often misguided and misled. And honoring the wrong things, valuing the material. And there is a cost to the being when this is viewed as appropriate or to be emulated. It is a cheapening of existence to seek power and control over others, whether economically or through denying love and acceptance to control others through your emotional life choosing to be hot or cold, to get what you want from others by doling out little bits of love from time to time, in a sense to entice them along through a kind of subterfuge where the agenda is phony, and dupes the victim, who is a truer human in truly appreciating the value of love and acceptance, when they will only be offered a simulation, a token gesture, an empty promise a kind of acted out love and acceptance.
as a substitute because of inner inadequacy and incompleteness. The business of life is complex and demanding, but it is the love-filled person who can handle any challenge and meet any demand, at least over time. Because they have the most important currency there is. They may have to seek those who will appreciate what they have to offer. But most people will. And it can carry them a long way. Depicting the ups and downs of life is a useful exercise because everyone needs guidance. Everyone needs examples and roles to learn from and at least be a point of departure. to have something to emulate. This gives many people greater courage to launch themselves forth and to be a champion of something because they've seen others do it and be victorious. That inspiration is extremely valuable and is a tremendous contribution when it leads to better things. If it points towards looking for something better than you are in the moment to become, showing that growth is needed, but also possible. When you see someone who stands strong, believing in truth, knowing who they are, and giving of themselves not only effectively, but wisely in a way that not only is valued and raises up those around them, but raises up themselves. That gives people something to work with that is real because it is showing divine principles and presents a guide for living that can be of help to them. This deeper truth and awareness was present within me as emotion, but not as logic and reason. I did not sit down with a script and think about how this advances truth to help the cause of the divine in the raising up of humanity. I considered whether it was authentic, whether it made me feel good, or whether it exposed some kind of darkness that stirred inner misgivings and feelings of loss. In other words, authenticity. 
And I was able to work with that to bring to life in my characters and through the story useful exchanges of energy that are a kind of guidepost to help people learn to recognize truth in things, a truth that can work for them in understanding not only what to do, but what not to do. And that always brings wisdom. And that is the goal of love, to bring greater wisdom to each person love touches. Okay, thank you. In 1989, you formally joined the army on the recommendations of Mao Guagong and became an ordinary actor in the Beijing military art troupe during which you only performed in the army. Why did you do this? This is a somewhat complicated story. And I do not wish to be disparaging of anyone or to bring discord or disquiet to the discussion if that can be avoided. So let me simply say I felt it was my duty. When people are chosen for an exceptional place in society, This creates an obligation inherent with that as well. In reality, we see from our vantage point in the light, in the heavenly realm, that all lives have value. No life is greater than another. And that is because you have a vastness far beyond your expression as a physical being and the life you are experiencing at the moment. It matters not your place in society, how long you live what you do or fail to do, except as it advances your own soul and makes some contributions to others in order to live in a balanced way, to gain ground rather than lose ground, in essence. So when chosen for something exceptional, This creates a kind of vacuum needing to be filled because you are living through the energies and acceptance of others. And if you take in that respect, that adulation, the admiration, and even the love of your admirers, it creates an imbalance. Love is an energy to be shared, to be exchanged, not to be hoarded, not to be accumulated as a trophy. So this decision to enter the military was partly a spiritual decision having to do with duty and obligation. 
and in a sense, enter a challenging environment, for me at least, with the same ambition as I brought to the first chapters of my life. It was not in my way of thinking a retreat or a lessening of challenges, even though it was in many ways a smaller audience, a smaller circle of influence for those things I participated in. It still drew on my talents I had cultivated, but were applied in a different setting with somewhat different goals in mind. But to me, the idea of the actress or entertainer applies just as well in serving a military audience as a civilian one. And to the extent it brings a creative energy to that organization is bringing with it a form of divinity in action. Everything that is of an artistic nature is a display of divinity. So even in a rigid autocratic structure that exemplifies some organizations, when they engage in ritual or celebration or want to influence others and they turn to the arts in some form, even as intentional propaganda. It is calling forth divine energy in its support and construction. At the same time, the propaganda might be self-serving, If it is conveying beauty in some way, it is a reminder of the divine and will stir the heart. The consequence can take many forms. The mind might be swayed by the propaganda, but the heart might be swayed by the divinity on display, unwittingly, unplanned, and not a cynic exploitation, but simply putting talent to work. And the divine shows up in the output. You see this everywhere you go, for the most part. Where even within the grounds and the buildings of tyrants, there might appear vase, vases of cut flowers. Or landscaping with a sweep and grandeur 
greatly pleasing to any eye. The tyrant might consider that a mistake if it were pointed out. But even they might be reluctant to destroy that beauty. This is a hint that all are divine and the words we say are true. It is why all are drawn to nature. And in a sense, all who strive for perfection and excellence, even a military organization, are striving for human betterment, if only in the way they know how, and in a narrow sense, to serve a particular purpose that might be more selfish than might be the case. But people are raised, exposed to such ideas and take it for granted. This is the way things are done and it is all important. So I was wanting to give of myself and do my all in that military setting for a set of complex reasons and motives. But there is honor in service to others. It might be overshadowed if the ultimate service is one of evil. That is a potential present for every human being and every body of work humans contribute to. If an army restores and maintains peace in providing security and a deterrent, it is a noble effort. There are many things to be gained from service and dedication. One is self-discipline. Another is a kind of sharing. But this cannot extend to a degree that harms the self. And that is the thing to keep in mind in all discussions of this kind, that there needs to be a balance so that the value of a life is recognized universally. And when the expectation is to surrender one's life, it needs to be for a noble aim, a lofty purpose, and in divine alignment with higher truth and wisdom. This is what I believed I was part of or wished it to be so. When organizations are faulty and have limits in effectiveness or in their particular 
level of ethics in the deployment and implementation. That is the responsibility of all involved to see to, to make things better, to be in better balance, and to serve in a way that will uplift and strengthen truly and not take something away from the participants or the society at large who depends on them. This will continue to be an ongoing challenge, as is true of life in general. For each life is a life of service to the aims of the culture, the society, the world around you. You, in effect, are a soldier of one. You may not choose to wear a uniform. But you are on the front lines of a great struggle. The contest of good and evil. You are in battle, but do not know it. Your enemy is largely unseen. It is hiding among you and within you. It is the reason armies are necessary. But it is also necessary that humans take action. and deploy the right solution to solve the problem of evil. We know the truth. The energy of the divine is greater than any human endeavor, military or not. And it can be your champion and your solution to the problems of society and the problems of your own life personally. Okay, thank you. After you died, it was written, quote, so after Qin Shoshu's death, we will say that there is more Lin Dayu in the sky. There is no Qin Shoshu in the world. This is by no means a beautiful world word. Unquote. Can you help us understand this better? We would use our love analogy. We have been threading through the discussion here. When you encounter a fine jewel and marvel at its features, the way it catches the light and sparkles, and perhaps has a beautiful coloring. And its rarity and value add to the preciousness that it represents. You are connecting with deep inner feelings about the reality of existence. You are simply being reminded that the creation is precious, it is beautiful, and it is priceless. If it is not always something that is a rarity that is in your purview, that does not negate these other qualities. It is simply reflecting that nature, miracle though it is, has a vast abundance 
that does not cheapen it. That makes it even vaster than might appear to a lone observer looking at a precious gem in their hand. The life of each person reflects the essence of divinity. If that individual lacks the wherewithal to shine their light into the world in a way that gets noticed and is appreciated as something special, something rare, something greater than expected. This sets people apart from one another but does not cheapen or lessen those who might be on the sidelines because they seemingly have no aspects of greatness to share with the world. They are great through the meaning of existence and are accepted and loved equally by creator. One of the meanings of this is that the soul is immortal. The beauty and grandeur of soul expression as a potential in every human being will live forever. It is your privilege to know the people about you, especially the ones you have access to directly. But those on the screen in a grand production by virtue of being made an example of heights of achievement and accomplishment are an inspiration to others and an example and will stimulate their yearnings to strive for greatness themselves. That spirit of the meaning of existence, the love that emanates, that shines from them and their example as a human being, can touch the hearts of many, and indeed will live on, whether through a knowing remembrance of their lives, or the consequences simply of the energy they bestowed to the world during their time on the planet because it is carried forward in the consequences that radiated out as ripples in a pond and will continue forever in the influence amplified and modified through the future energies of others and even themselves returning to the fray in a future lifetime. The meaning of existence is a, pretend, a perpetual growth and expansion 
of love and its possibilities. When your life is touched by another's and you lose them on their passing, it is felt deeply and as a grievous wound. But the reality is they are only absent from being with you, but continue to exist elsewhere and are even still a part energetically of the human family you all share together. That is change, but not a diminishment. You yourselves are here to fill the gaps left by others who came before you. How you do that will count similarly. You have an opportunity to give more love than even you receive. Because your love quotient does not come from others. It comes from the divine on request. If you want to give love in some form and you call on the divine, you will receive an endless supply to work with. That is the meaning of the divine and the demonstration of the divine in action. And that is how people, even in a difficult, challenging world, show love in their lives again and again and again, no matter what. It is only extinguished for a time, no matter how harsh people are treated. They will come away from their time of suffering and deprivation still looking for someone to share love with in spite of all that happens. That is the nature of the greatness within you, that you know love when you see it and when you feel it, and you seek it because it is the most precious of commodities, and you see it in others and value them for what they have shared with you. They might be gone one day, but you will still be here. And the love they showed the world, you can show the world also, perhaps in a different way, but it will still matter. If you make your life count, it will raise up others. And one day, that love will be returned to you, maybe in a future lifetime, where you are blessed with friends and a loving family, and perhaps a circle of admirers, because you are gifted with talents and strengths to shine your light in a way others admire and that will make you a leader. Give of yourself and the world will give back to you in greater abundance. 
Okay, thank you. This is my last question. We're trying to grow the Get Wisdom mission and spread the word about prayer and healing to China and the non-English speaking world. We now have a fledgling presence on WeChat, easily one of the largest social media platforms in the world with 1.2 billion users. You are one of the most successful advertisers in China, and perhaps you can tell us if we're on the right track. And what could we be doing better in order to introduce ourselves to the people of China? Is it wise to think that China will play an important role in the salvation of humanity? We believe in this wholeheartedly because there is a sleeping tiger in a sense that not all the love potential is being unleashed. This is true of the whole world. The greatness of China is that it is made of people. It is the people who are great, not the aggregate and how it defines itself in human terms, by human standards and human institutions. If people simply do their best and strive to help one another, and yes, see to their obligations, society expects, but do so with an eye towards fairness and wanting to enjoy the gifting of their abilities and do so in a loving way. That love intention will be felt, will be shared, will be valued, and will be returned in kind. This is a prescription for growth and advancement in a positive way that will benefit all of you. This is truly what you seek. The world can be a dark and threatening place. If you shine light through bestowing love, this will make you ever more powerful. It is love that is underrated as a source of power and influence. All of the things you strive for as a people are designed for the benefit of someone or something. This is inherently a lofty enterprise you engage with each and every day. So we are telling you that all around the world are seeking the same things. You may do it in somewhat different ways under different banners and different flags and different political ideologies. But if you think of greatness as an environment in which love and happiness flourish, that is not contradictory to anyone's goals. There is room for both. And in fact, the bringing of love will help conquer any adversary and lead to success and a flourishing 
society. We know this is true because we know history through an undistorted lens that failure, impoverishment, being vanquished by a stronger adversary are failures in the implementation of love as the root cause. When you are working together in common cause, contributing to the all, striving in unison and in harmony, but doing so through joy as loving contributors, that is quite a different thing than rallying and putting on a performance that might look impressive to a camera, but is hollow inside and devoid of true purpose and substance. So in your enterprise and outreach, you can know that you are striving to reach fellow human beings first and foremost. That is why we have tried mightily here to talk about your questions and your efforts with this discussion using a language that is universal and that can touch the minds and hearts of others to see you as a friend and not an adversary. That is always a first step with any encounter to see if one can be trusted and whether they are willing to trust the other party. This can be difficult if there is a difficult history and inner reservations. And those are often born of ignorance and inexperience and the inevitable consequences of being divided by distance, differing languages, differing cultural makeup, and the problems of historical difficulties and discord. We see all problems as being solvable. If you continue to be ambassadors of love and happiness, you might make some enemies along the way. But those will be enemies of the deeper truth of things. They will be individuals endeavoring to deny the realities of existence that humans are love-based beings. And it is in the context of love given and exchanged freely where the best things happen. And it creates no room for conflict or for exploitation and deceiving of others. Being in a loving frame of mind and holding loving intentions is a strength. And it is a state of inner validity 
that will garner respect by most people. At worst, they might see you as naive and perhaps even as vulnerable, not understanding the true power inherent in being aligned with love. But there is no downside in being open to love and bestowing acceptance on others who come with loving intentions. And you will find you are among friends. All share the same planet and the same aspirations and have the same goals in mind. Happiness and the experiencing of love are the ultimate achievements and sources of enjoyment and pleasure that make life truly worthwhile. When you come forth as a champion of love, you are by definition, a friend to all and a potential valuable partner in the journey of life. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for answering these questions today. And with that, I would like to ask Carl to come back. I feel really good about this exchange. Um, I love this person enormously, just hearing these sentiments, and it was expressed in, in such a loving way and with an earnestness that I could feel viscerally in being part of that communication stream because it comes with that energy of intention along with it that I can pick up you know, and that kind of vibe and, and, and I get a feel for the person in their, their makeup, the part they're showing and sharing. And it, I find it quite beautiful and quite moving and a genuine desire to help people understand the bigger picture of things. And, and so I, I hope others take the message in that same way and give it its due and and consider her words and the meaning so i i uh i i'm very happy we did this yeah yeah you know it, it's a nice gesture it's it's kind of like a handshake in a way yeah but you have to start somewhere right you know and we're we're just a strange commodity and a strange presence and uh unknown to the many we're wanting to reach out to, but I hope that'll change. I hope we'll make many, you know, direct friends. Yeah, and be of, and be of help to others. I feel, I feel well. like the message was that you know don't get hung up on the language. The language doesn't matter. It's what behind. It's what's behind the words, the intentions mm. that are going to make the difference, and um, you know help us cross bridges that the language can't do of its own. You know if. If the love intentions behind it, then the rest will carry through. Don't worry about the the fact that we can't speak Chinese or interpret the language well. Yes, well, language is a barrier. It certainly is for me. Yeah. And I I've known a number of Chinese people, and always marvelled at their facility with with the language that they 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 come with and. Uh, and how complex it is. Yeah. And, you know, it's really quite an elegant construction. And so I, 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 I'm hoping I never have to learn it, frankly. I'll admit that up front. Yeah. 
I'm not sure I'm up to the task at my age, but uh, yeah. But uh, it, I, it I think her, her message here was that you know don't don't think of it as a barrier, because um, mm. it's not. Um, you know, if we pay attention to the things that that she was saying in the channeling, that it's a less of an impediment than we're you know than we're thinking you know that we think it is. I, I, that's the message I thought I was getting. You know that it's a worthwhile outreach as long as it's. Um, you would pay attention to the intentions, if you will. Yeah, well, yeah. people will feel it. Right. People feel it. And, you know, we all have this kind of intuitive antenna to one degree or another, some more than others. But we read people. We read their energy, and we kind of get a sense, you know, are they trying to fool us and and deceive us? Are they trustworthy and honest or... Are they just? Do they have some kind of uh, hidden motive? And they're 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 phony, and and then whether they're genuine will come through in that energy, and people can tell. They can, yeah. You know, some people can read you like a book, and they just know, right? You know, right away to avoid someone or not. So that that works in our favor because. The intentions matter, and uh, that's what most people care about the most. Right. Well, and I think in get, for Get Wisdom, you know, the emphasis, the, the content emphasis is on what the divine realm says, what the what uh, creator says. And I think that's like, you know, that's the ultimate savior in any enterprise. If you, if you can keep that front and center and let all the other all the other. So, you know, I was saying, you know, I, I think our saving grace with the Get Wisdom mission as it pertains to, um, you know, trying to make outreaches in, lang in other languages where they don't speak English is that you know, we've always kept the content or we've always tried to keep the content of the divine realm. You know, the, ch the, ch the channeling subjects, they're in the divine realm. They're speaking from the divine realm. In creator's words, we always try to keep that. Um, the majority of the content, you know, we're not trying to push through, push that through some kind of funnel, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And I think yeah. all of that is going to survive the translation because of the intention that's behind it. So it's like, um, it's like, for us, it's like insurance, you know, we really can't go wrong as long as we're doing that. I think it's going to really help us in a way that um, we would it would be very hard for us to duplicate that in, in any other way by having really good translations or a really you know good marketing company or a really good spokesperson or you know all the other things that we might try to like push in there to to have things kind of go in our favor we don't really have to worry about that because we've got creators words front and center leading the way yeah and that's that's well said and and I think it's important to articulate this very carefully and thoroughly that we have something we think is a value we want to give. And it's because it's hard won for us. We looked a long time and with a lot of energy to, to acquire the information and awarenesses that we have. And so we naturally value that and think it's, of value to others and want others to share in it. But I would never claim to be all knowing and to have all the answers and to know everything about everything that we really need to. And so we need everyone to be participants in this ongoing quest. Right. I, I couldn't think of a better example of being fish out of the water than doing this. This is a great example yeah. of how little we know about yeah. you know, how we're <laughs> we're venturing into territory where we we don't have any uh, aces up our sleeve you know we're we're going to china yeah. to to two guys from a completely different culture no language skills um so you know this might be a good test of things right here um you know v venturing outside of the uh the confines if you will yeah well I, and i hope people will look beyond us yeah. And not think all oh, these two American guys, you know, what what could they know? And, you know, this isn't about us. This is about the right. almighty. And if if it's true that there is a God. 
that has a lot of implications. Right. And it behooves us to learn what we can about that. And that's that's the journey I have been on and with and with get wisdom in seeking a way to probe that realm. We've encountered lots of information about the world as a whole, how it works and why, and problems that are going on and existing. Because I've I started the things I'm doing wanting to help others and to help them heal with the problems in their life. And I was willing to do anything. I started out as a scientific researcher wanting to contribute to medicine and then more to move into the psychological aspects. But it it didn't matter to me what form that meant, you know, devising new chemicals to take as a pill to help your unhappiness. You know, if that works, I'm all for it. Why not? Yeah. Or some form of therapy. Okay, if that works, yeah. why not? What works? Yeah, what but works? to my surprise, what I found out is belief in the divine works. Yeah. <laughs> it can make I, good things happen. I like the uh, in the one answer, you know, the, the uh, talking about the sleeping tiger, you know, the outreach to China and, you know, the potential of China contributing to um, the solution here. And um, right on the heels of that statement was, well, that's true of everyone, and, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. But, so, so it's her words, yeah. not mine. Right. But I think that's the take-home message, that there's room for all of us to keep growing and learning yeah. and yeah. doing better. Yeah. And the, and the motivations will be the same, irrespective of, of culture and language and all the differences that we're, that we're encountering in this whole adventure. So, um, well, we, we've chewed up the clock once again, rather handily. <laughs> so, um, we had help. <laughs> yeah. 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 The divine realm help. We got a, we got thorough answers and we usually always get, um, you know, usually get thorough answers. I would say we always get thir- thir- thorough answers, but I want to just thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Carl, especially for doing this with us every week. And, uh, Carl and I will be back with another channeling soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Be well.